Utopia and Art The consideration of what we mean by education leads naturally on to a consideration of what we mean by art, since outside of its utilitarian purpose of fitting human beings to take their place in society, the function of education is, as has been indicated, the development of sensibility, what is generally called culture. Though it is a bad word. It is a bad word because it is a thoroughly ambiguous word, a pretentious word, a charlatan of a word. No wonder Herbert Reed echoes Eric Gill and cries, to hell with culture. Reed, in his little book under the title, asks, what is culture? And points out that the Greeks hadn't a word for it. They had good architects, good sculptors, good poets, just as they had good craftsmen and good statesmen. They knew that their way of life was a good way of life, but it would never have occurred to them that they had a separate commodity, culture. Something to be given a trademark by their academicians, something to be acquired by superior people with sufficient time and money, something to be exported to foreign countries along with figs and olives. It wasn't even an invisible export. It was something natural, if it existed at all, something of which they were unconscious. It could not even be described as a byproduct of their way of life. It was that way of life itself. Culture suggests something special and apart, outside of daily life. Culture tastes are carefully cultivated tastes, imposed from without, diligently acquired. Art is something in a museum or gallery. We talk about art with a capital A. And by cultured person, we understand a person with a appreciation for art with a capital A. It is all false, artificial, because art, as Eric Gill has never tired of pointing out, was simply something well made, from a fine painting to a piece of domestic pottery. Herbert Reed reminds us that in the Middle Ages, its architects were foreman builders, its sculptors were masons, its illuminators and painters were clerks. They had no word for art in the sense of our fine arts. Art was all that was pleasing to the sight, a cathedral, a candlestick, a chessman, a cheese press. With the development of capitalism and industrialization, there arose an acquisitive class. People who, by the control of labor and raw materials and the means of production, could command beautiful things to be made exclusively for them. And the machine finally separated art, as the common thing beautifully made, from daily life. Art became beautiful things made specially for the privileged few who could afford them. The machine dispensed with the necessity for handicrafts. The common things of daily life began to be mass-produced. The beautiful things become art, not for the common people. There arose the cult of art, the thing called culture. The peak of all this unnaturalness and decadence was the 1890s and art for art's sake exclusively. Art utterly and finally divorced from common life, art is something esoteric. In Utopia, where every man is a special kind of artist, over and above the utilitarian aspect, education brings out the artist in every man, develops his natural tastes. No one considers him uncultured, that is to say, lacking in sensibilities, if he fails to appreciate Shakespeare or Beethoven. It may well be that his sensibilities do not reach out to the past at all. He may be one of those who do not want their poetry written down, who find it implicitly in the rhythm of a bird's wings in movement of the clouds, shadows over hills, music for him may be something he makes for himself with a hollow reed, all that comes idly into his head as he plows a field or works a lathe. It does not indicate a greater degree of sensibility to take music and poetry ready-made from the past. In Utopia, what in our world we call art, music, painting, poetry, sculpture, is all part of life, not something apart in museums, galleries and concert halls. That is not to say that there are no museums, galleries and concert halls. Museums and galleries are useful in the way that libraries are, for reference. But the idea of a piece of sculpture being made or a picture painted merely in the hope of acquisition by a museum or gallery, the idea that there is any honor in such acceptance, is alien to the utopian conception. In utopia, good pictures and sculpture are put into museums and galleries only if no better use can be found for them. It is a matter of regret with a painter or sculptor. It is considered very much more satisfactory if a sculpture can be put to some good use in a garden or public park, or to ornament a building, public or private. And the painter would much rather have a wall to paint on than a canvas, because then his work has purpose, a direct relationship with life. 
Similarly, a composer of music would prefer to compose for an occasion, a pageant, a procession, a harvest home celebration, or a May Day festivity, or some such merrymaking. In Utopia, it is regarded as a much greater honor for a composition to be played or sung on some such occasion than rendered to an audience in a concert hall. Utopia, in fact, vastly prefers the applied arts to the fine arts. The fine picture or sculpture or musical composition purely as aesthetic experience, purely for entertainment, seems a little wasteful. But it is not doctrinaire or puritanical about it, as Eric Gill was. Gill considered that concert audiences were like debauchees at a Roman feast, and passionately protested against the divorce of music from occasion, music as an end in itself, purely for pleasure. It was all part of his abhorrence of the divorce of work from beauty and of beauty from usefulness, and in principle the utopians are in agreement with this attitude. But they have no objection to pleasure unalloyed, just as they might believe that rational meat-eating is gross and unhealthy, a devouring of corpses, but that, nevertheless, on occasion, a roast chicken or a game pie is well worth the sacrifice of rationality and principle. So, though they entirely agree that listening to music in a concert hall is highly unnatural and purely sensuous, and not the best use to which it could be put, they go to concerts or listen to them on the radio with a natural and untroubled enjoyment. As far as possible, concerts are given in the open air, which is considered pleasanter and healthier than the stuffy atmosphere of a concert hall. Sometimes these concerts are given in clearings in the woods or on lawns in public parks, sometimes in open-air theatres designed on the Roman plan. Ballets and plays are performed, similarly, in the open air, in preference to indoors whenever possible. The difference between art in Utopia and in our present world is to be found in the popular attitude to it. In our world, it is taken for granted that art is something special and apart, for a picture gallery, the concert hall, the theater, the museum. Our devotion to it is like the devotion of the orthodox religious people. A periodic visit to the temple must be made. Whereas in Utopia, you can hear as good music in the marketplace as at the concert hall, see as good painting on a street wall as in a picture gallery. It is part of daily life, all the time. And, as everything is well made, by master craftsmen, people are used to beautiful things, so that beauty, too, is not something apart, related to something called art. But it also is part of daily life. The utopians find it difficult to believe that there was ever a time when beautiful vases and statuettes and carvings and such things were locked up in cabinets, in private houses, merely to be looked at. That there were such things as objets d'art, many of them not even beautiful, and with no value except of antiquity which is a value that they do not understand except historically. Obviously, an ancient Roman carving has value, the value of historic interest, even if it does not happen to be beautiful. But then its place is in museums, where it may be examined by students of Roman civilization. In Utopia, art is at every street corner, beautiful architecture everywhere, decoratively designed fountains, statues, not, one need hardly say, of statesmen in frock coats, by the finest sculptors, gay-painted frescoes on houses. In the houses, every table and chair, every rug, every kitchen pot is a work of art. For the utopians, art is, quite simply, the thing well made. Its value is something decorative, something utilitarian. Sometimes, as in the case of a poem, a piece of music, a play, ballet, a story, it is purely for delight. The education of the utopians has given them this understanding of ends and means. They know that, as the modern critic has expressed it, art is itself neither use nor beauty, any more than it is goodness or truth. It is the ordering of doing and making for use, and the ordering of expression for delight. It arrives at beauty incidentally, by pursuing use in the arts of use, significance in the arts of emotion. Accepting art in these terms, the utopians are in favor of introducing every manifestation of art as widely as possible, without self-consciousness, into daily life wherever it is possible to apply it to a utilitarian purpose, whether practical or decorative, they apply it. Wherever it is possible to adapt it to occasion, they adapt it. Where it is purely for delight, that too, being freely available to all, becomes also a part of daily life. Good music, being widely played in public parks and in cafes, is to a large extent liberated from the concert hall. Similarly, painting, being as far as possible mural, 
as much in the home as in the public building, is largely liberated from picture galleries. On the purely sensuous side, music, painting and dancing combine for delight in the ballet, and though music and singing are related as far as possible to occasion, there is still the unnaturalness of opera for those who find pleasure in it. There is likewise poetry and literature and drama, sometimes purely for delight, sometimes for the illumination of life, but never, and this is important to the utopians, never degraded to the purpose of propaganda. At this point it becomes important to make clear what is meant by propaganda. Earlier in this book reference was made to the degradation of poetry, music, painting in the USSR by making it the handmaid of the communist propaganda. And in Nazi Germany, painting, if not the other arts, were similarly degraded. Nazis and communists alike weighed more on what they describe as decadent art, by which they mean art which does not conform to or fit in with their particular political dialectic. When the present writer was in Moscow in 1936, Chekhov was held in disrepute on the grounds that his plays offer no solution to the societal problems they present. The idol was Gorky who continually urged writers to use their art for the furtherance of the socialist state and expressed contempt for literature which, having no social significance, does not so serve the state. In the same year, the Soviet composer Shostakovich was attacked by Pravda and rebuked by the Soviet composers for non-Soviet tendencies and for writing above the heads of the Soviet masses. Of this, Viktor Serov writes in his book on Shostakovich, Streams of letters were written to the composers' unions, filled with vitriolic criticisms of Shostakovich's work, and resolutions were published with the headlines, Down with the bourgeois estates and formalists, Long live music for the millions, and Down with formalist confusion in art. The young composer was hurled down from the pedestal on which his opera, Lady Macbeth, had first placed him. The opera was banned and he was musically ostracized. Serov comments, It is interesting to note that no one expressed publicly the fact that Pravda's editorials went far deeper than mere music criticism. Shostakovich changed his style, became powerful and intelligible in his music, and made his comeback 18 months later, eventually winning the Stalin Prize for a piano quintet which Pravda described as lyrically lucid, human and simple. Serov writes, just as Futurism and Cubism and even Impressionism in painting are not greatly favored in the Soviet Union, so atonal music or music full of mysticism remains alien to the Soviet idea. He quotes Shostakovich as saying of Skriabin, at one time a leading Russian composer, Thus we regard Skriabin as our bitterest musical enemy. Why? Because Skriabin's music tends to an unhealthy eroticism also to mysticism and passivity and escape from the realities of life. In Utopia, there is no question of any artist being required to toe any line. The fact that there is no state to make any such direction obviates this, of course, but the whole spirit of Utopian society is opposed to any kind of dictatorship in principle, even if it were possible. The artist is free to say, through the medium of his art, whether it be painting, poetry, plays, music, literature, sculpture, whatever he feels impelled to say. He may feel impelled to express some comment on society, satirical or critical, as he sees it. He may feel that he has some spiritual message to convey, some illumination to offer. He may be solely concerned with self-expression, the expression of something deep in himself, or the expression solely of his creative impulse. Whatever he is concerned with is entirely his affair. In our present society, an artist sometimes feel impelled to indict certain evils of society through his art, and he writes a book or a play or paints a picture to that end. If he is a good artist, the propaganda that is, the criticism he is making, the moral he is trying to point out, is implicit in the work itself. If he is an inferior artist, the whole thing is clumsy and defeats its own ends, because people feel that it would all have been better done straightforwardly as a tract or a pamphlet. There is no reason at all why art should not be a criticism of or a comment on life. But there is also no reason why it should be. The comment may or may not be a criticism. The criticism may or may not constitute an indictment. May or may not paint a moral. The important thing is that the artist shall be free. That he shall be free to interpret life as he sees it, as he feels it. To say what he has to say, express what he has to express. Art is a thing well made and a well-made play or poem or picture or story or piece of sculpture may or may not have something of social significance to say. The emphasis is on the social. 
A work of art is always significant in one way or another. It has meaning, that is to say, it is not negligible. In Utopia, it is obvious that there is much less scope for social significance in art, since the social problems are disposed of. There is no unemployment, except the happy unemployment, of desired leisure in which to enjoy life. No poverty, no war, none of the things that artists in our present society feel called upon on occasion to indict. This does not mean, however, that there are no problems. Human relationships, for one thing, will always present problems, though the rational education and moral code of Utopia naturally minimizes them. And no society is going to satisfy, completely, in all respects, every single member of it, which means that there will always be room for criticism. There are, in all probability, in the free stateless society some who sigh for the good old days of centralized government, or for some other form of government, for anything but what exists. Any healthy society is stimulated by its discontents, and in Utopia, the borderline between discontent and dreamer is very fine. As Wilde said, Utopia is a country in which, when humanity lands, there is always the vision of something beyond, always the horizon, and progress is the realization of utopias, the preternatural movement towards the horizon, which fades forever and forever as we move. The discontents of Utopia are not malcontents, but visionaries, the progressives of the community, dreaming beyond the happy present to an even more glorious future. The work of the artist is necessarily colored by the times in which he lives. A decadent society will produce decadent art, and a progressive, inspired society will produce inspired, progressive art. In the freedom of Utopia, the artist has room to spread his wings, and he is freed from the economic problems which harass him, and so largely influence his work in our present society. The painter is not called upon to paint conventional portraits of boring people for the sake of earning a living. The writer is not required to prostitute his gifts for the vulgarity of cheap journalism and an uneducated popular demand. The artist, in whatever medium he works, has his integral place in society, along with the carpenter, the shoemaker, the plowman, all of whom, it is recognized, are also artists in their different spheres. There is no longer a halo around the fine arts. Art, in Utopia, is simply a thing well made. Whether it is a chair or a song, a painting or a pot, a poem or a cathedral. And the artist is completely free to express himself, according to his inspiration, to say, without let or hindrance, whatever he has to say, through his imagination, as in music, poetry, literature, or through his imagination plus the craftsmanship of his hands, in a painting, sculpture, pottery, or wood carving. As to the fine arts, they are integrated with the decorative and applied arts, that, to all intents and purposes, they cease to exist. Painting and sculpture exist primarily in relation to architecture, and architecture, more than any of the arts, is an expression of the human spirit. The architecture of Utopia, therefore, is of noble proportions, because its spires are the spires of dreams, its arches lofty with ideals. Utopia is completely free of the hideous architectural vulgarities which industrialism, with its money values, produced in the 19th century, and of the shoddy mass-production monstrosities of the 20th, ranging from pseudo-Tudor to what Osbert Lancaster has defined as 20th century functional. All the smugness and complacency of the Victorian era is expressed in its architecture. All the upsurge of the human spirits in the light of new learning emerges with grace and beauty in the architecture of the Renaissance. All the falsity of the 20th century is expressed in its pretentious villas, its barracks of flats, the streamlined modernity. Morris, in 1900, declared that the world was uglier than it was 50 years ago. Today it is still uglier than it was 50 years ago. We pass from ugly to uglier, and the tendency is all to uglier still. Kropotkin made a similar complaint of the ugliness of his world and pointed out, when a Greek sculptor chiseled his marble, he endeavored to express the spirit and heart of the city. All its passions, all its traditions of glory, were to live again in the work. But today, the united city has ceased to exist, there is no more communion of ideas. The town is a chance of agglomeration of people who do not know one another who have no common interest, save that of enriching themselves at the expense of one another. Only when cities, territories, nations or groups of nations will have renewed their harmonious life, will art be able to draw its inspiration from ideals held in common. Then will the architect conceive the city's monuments, which no longer be a temple, a prison or a fortress, 
Then will the painter, the sculptor, the carver, the ornament worker know where to put their canvases, their statues and their decorations. Deriving their power of execution from the same vital source and gloriously marching all together towards the future. But till then, art can only vegetate. We cannot visualize the architecture of utopia except in the general terms. We can be sure that it is free of excrescences, that it has grace and dignity, that the lives of the people have grace and dignity just as our present architecture is vulgar and commercial because our lives are vulgar and commercial. We can be sure that it makes full use of the decorative arts, that it is harmoniously in line and in relation to its setting, that it is in all aspects an expression of the harmony of the community because its inspiration is drawn, as Kropotkin says, from ideals held in common. Today we have no common ideals. Our architecture is a mere conglomeration of buildings thrown up according to indiscriminate notions of utility, impressiveness, economy and completely without regard for any harmonious whole. Nothing else could be expected of a society devoid of harmony. A competitive society of each for himself and the devil take the hindmost. It is impossible to see clearly, in detail, what utopia looks like, physically since it is impossible to predict how much will survive of the modern world to be carried over into utopia. In a series of world wars, the glories of the Middle Ages and of the Renaissance can and do disappear overnight. We can but hope that some, at last, of the riches of the past will survive 20th century barbarism. That there will still be Oxford, minus its present slums. That there will be Charter Cathedral and St. Trophem at Orles, and Venice, intact with St. Mark's and the Doge's Palace those visions in a dream, and some, at least, of the superb Baroque architecture of Munich, Vienna, Salzburg, Würzburg, and something left of the medieval enchantments of Nuremberg, Ghent, Bruges. All these things have their place in Utopia, along with the old houses of the Savant, along the quays at Saint-Louis in Paris. The tall, old yellow houses, looking through the plane trees and the poplars that reach out over the river, and the old gabled houses along the Amsterdam canals, one can only hope that Rome will survive. The twin towers of the old yellow Trinita dei Monti continue to lift their beauty above the magnificent horseshoe sweep of the steps that are flanked at one side by Shelley's house, that flowers will continue to blow amongst the ruins of the palaces and the temples of the Palatine Hill, that nothing will happen to the Duomo and Baptistery in Florence, or the little town of Fiesole on the hillside above. So many pages from the past in Europe are worthy to be carried over into the utopian world. The terraced and befountained gardens at such palaces as Versailles, Tivoli, Frascati would make happy playgrounds for the utopians. Indeed, they are hardly likely to make fountains or gardens more beautiful. Morris, in his utopia, retained Oxford, as we have seen, and made it the task of his utopians to restore England to what it was before it became industrialized. The huge and foul workshops surrounded by the slum dwellings of the workers were disposed of, melted away into a general country and England became once more a green and pleasant land, a garden where nothing is wasted and nothing is spoiled, with the necessary dwellings, sheds and workshops scattered up and down the country, all trim and neat and pretty. When people have any sense of architectural power, Morris declared, as they have in freedom, they know that they can have what they want, and then, like the medievals, they like everything trim and clean and orderly and bright. Beyond this, Morris does not specify the architecture of his nowhere. It was trim and pretty and neat. It was enclosed by trees in a garden like England. The reader must fill in the details from imagination stirred by the bare outline. Sir Thomas More, on the other hand, seems to have seen his utopia as clearly as though he had himself been there. He all but gives its latitude and longitude. His utopia is an island, and there are 54 cities, including the capital, which is set upon a hill. The cities are all large and well built. The capital is walled with many towers and forts and surrounded by a moat on three sides and a river on the fourth. The streets are very convenient for carriages and are well sheltered from the winds. Their buildings are good and are so uniform that a whole side of the street looks like one house. The streets are 20 feet broad. There lie gardens behind all their houses. These are large but enclosed with buildings that on all hands face the streets so that every house has both a door to the street and a back door to the garden. All is well ordered and finely kept. These houses are three stories high, the fronts faced with stone, plastering or brick. The roofs are flat and the windows glazed. Over the river there is a bridge of fair stone consisting of many stately arches. 
That bridge of fair stone, with its many stately arches, conveys, perhaps, more than all the detail of the architecture of the houses. It conveys the tone, the whole architectural standard. You know that in the city where that bridge is to be found, all will be dignified and gracious and fair. That should you find such a city outside of dreams, you would have come to Walt Whitman city. Invincible to the attacks of the whole rest of the earth, the new city of friends. In Utopia, sculpture is as nearly as possible related to architecture. What Gill calls a natural flowering of the walls and pillars of buildings. He reminds us that the word decoration means that which is decorous, which is proper and seemly. Just as ornament is that which is required to furnish something. In the way that candlesticks are the ornament, in this sense, of the altar. When sculpture is removed from the art schools and studios and museums and art galleries and becomes the natural flowering of architecture, the product of the exuberance of the workmen, the sculptor achieves his proper place in society. That of responsible workmen, as responsible as the bricklayers, the stonemasons, the architects themselves, and his art, that is to say his work, is given the proper place. Not something esoteric in a part, but an integral part of the whole. In the USSR, artists, that is to say writers, painters, musicians, sculptors, actors, are a privileged class. And it is as much a criticism of the USSR that this should be so, as it is a criticism of capitalist countries, that whilst people called artists are regarded as special and apart, nevertheless they can be allowed to starve if they fail to achieve commercial success for themselves. And, as we have seen, Artists in the USSR are only a privileged and honor class so long as they toe the government propaganda line. The artist has a better time of it in the capitalist countries, since at least he is free to express his own ideas in his own way. He may even succeed by stubbornly persisting in ideas commonly regarded as revolutionary. Witness Jacob Epstein, whose works continue to shock the conventionally minded, but whose celebrity increases with the years. The Mexican painter Diego Rivera is a strong advocate of the integration of painting, sculpture and architecture. In his proposed innovations for the art school curriculum there is, writes his biographer Bertram Wolf, a steady insistence on the artist as a workman in both the physical and the social senses. And a central role is assigned to the study of the comparative styles and the history of art in terms of the social role of the various arts. Finally, there is a continuous integration of painting and sculpture with each other, and both of them with architecture. The greater part of Diego's own work is mural painting, and Wolf observes, in this connection, if only for its own sake, art must enter once more in the public arena. Too long has it abdicated its power to speak of man of his destiny, and today, when that destiny presents its riddle in the political terms, art dare no longer proclaim itself indifferent and incapable. A Rockefeller buys a wall to smash it. A Hitler expels art from a land of culture because it cannot prove a Biedermeier grandparentage. Even the proletarian land, struggling forward amidst backwardness and hostility, becomes contaminated with offscouring of totalitarianism. In Utopia, this integration of painting, sculpture, architecture is continuously thought. The art of the studio is not despised, but the aim of the painter and the sculpture is always towards this integration and the failure to achieve it is a matter of regret. It cannot be overemphasized that in Utopia, the conception of the artist is that of the workman, the good craftsman. The fine arts and the decorative arts merge, and all work well done is art, something made, the creative product of human skill. In the previous chapter, we have discussed the use of the film in Utopia for educational purposes, and made some reference to its entertainment value. And we cannot close this discussion of art in Utopia without some consideration of the film as art. Let us make no mistake about it. The film's potentiality as art is as great as its educational potentialities. Art being simply the thing well made. In Utopia, the film is as much art as the noble piece of architecture, the finely woven cloth, the beautiful song or poem, the pleasing musical composition and its skilled rendering. The same basic principle of fine craftsmanship applies. But the film is an integration of several arts. The craftsmanship of the story writer, the producer, the photographer, the actors, the designer of the sets and many many more people aside. And the utopians apply the same criticism to the film as to the stage play or a story or a novel or a painting, that is to say, they demand that it shall have sincerity and truth. And that it shall, in some way or another, illuminate some aspect of life. 
whether it is realism or fantasy, they demand these qualities of the finished production. In Utopia, there is nothing approaching a film convention. They would greet with derisive laughter a film heroine who went through a gale and emerged without a hair out of place. Any distortion of history they would regard with contempt. And as to altering the climax of a book, a play, a story, for the sake of a happy ending, anything so absurd would not occur to them. So profound is their passion for truth. And even in Utopia, not every real-life story has a happy ending by any means. So complex is human nature, so irrational, in spite of everything, human emotions. This passion for truth disposes of the convention that film actresses must be beautiful and film actors handsome. Nor is a love interest considered essential to a film story. The Utopians have a high regard for the artistic integrity of a number of films that came out of France up to the time of World War II. The satirical whimsiness of René Clair, before his ghost went west, especially delight them. And for several German films of the pre-Hitler era. They are well aware that the remarkable imaginative German film, The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, made film history in 1920. That it was, as Paul Rother wrote in 1930, once and for all the first attempt at the expression of a creative mind in the new medium of cinematography. It amazes the Utopians that the film did not go on from there, but as it developed technically, achieved sound and color, degenerated artistically, until it touched bottom in the Hollywood vulgarities of the 30s and 40s. The Utopians have a great respect, also, for some of the early Russian films. Outstandingly, A Battleship Potemkin, made in 1925. They consider that, as the Stalinist era developed, the films of the USSR became increasingly propagandist and top-heavy with it. Their admiration for the English actor Charles Chaplin makes it a little difficult for them to remember that his films classify as American. <laughs> and, apart from his contribution, they have little use for American films outside of a very few exceptions, notably The Grapes of Wrath. Nor, with the exception of one or two documentary films, Drifters of 1924 and San Demetrio 1944, have they little interest in English pre-Utopian films. There is no doubt in the minds of the Utopians that before World War II the finest films, in fact the only films of authentic artistic value, were coming out of France. They do not claim in Utopia to have produced anything finer than Jean du Voyage, La Femme du Boulanger, La Grande Illusion, Le Dernier Milliardaire. But whether grave or gay, realistic or fantastic, their own films are all of this class. In Utopia, it is all much easier, of course, to maintain a high standard, since there is no box office to watch, no stars commanding huge salaries for the exploitation of their sex appeal. The Utopians are not interested in the stars of either stage or screen. They know from experience that the brilliant amateur frequently outshines the slick professional, brings to the part a feeling, a sincerity, the professional shed years ago. They are aware that even in the pre-Utopian era, some of the more intelligent film producers occasionally had the inspiration to use ordinary people in place of professionals. There was a beautiful film of the South Seas, called Taboo, in which the cast were all natives, quite new to such work. And there was the Irish film, Man of Oran, which, similarly, used the natives of the place. There are, of course, professional actors and actresses in Utopia, people with a special gift who make their acting a full-time job. But no special importance attaches to them, they are not more highly paid than anyone else, and no particular glamour attaches to them, nor is there any particular demand for them. The demand, all the time, is for the right person for the part, and very often, such is the artistic integrity of the Utopians, it is found that some quite unknown and inexperienced person fits the role better than any of the professionals. In Utopia, names mean nothing, the play is the thing, and who can best interpret it. Despite the high artistic level of the film in Utopia, however, the theatre is, on the whole, more popular, the flesh and blood actors being preferred to the moving pictures of them. The Utopians regard the film as chiefly valuable for educational purposes, and for what, in our world, we call documentaries. The Utopians make very beautiful documentary films, showing various aspects of life in different countries, and the explanatory running commentary is intelligently written, free of facetiousness and wisecracking in all such vulgarities, and delivered in a pleasant, natural voice. The Utopians make the utmost use of the open-air theatre. They prefer to take their recreation as much as possible out of doors. Which is another reason for preferring the theatre to the cinema. They regard the stuffy darkness of the cinema as one of its backdraws. Every town and village has its open-air theatre, in the Roman style, as we have indicated. But with arrangements made for giving the performance under shelter, in bad weather, 
And there are companies of strolling players who travel from place to place giving performances in barns, village halls, marketplaces, public squares, wherever is most convenient. The utopians, being well educated in the real sense, are very Catholic in their tastes. They like all kinds of plays, they like Greek tragedies, they like Shakespeare, they like the tragedies and the comedies of their own times. But whatever is given, by whomever it is given, it is art. That is to say, the thing well made, well written, well produced, well acted. Any number of their plays, both stage and screen, are light in texture, designed only to amuse. But they are never false or shoddy. Even the lightest trifle has truth at its heart, a conception of spiritual values, and is touched with beauty and an implicit poetry. There is not much attendance at cinemas in the summer months. The utopians prefer to be in the open air. In some parts of Utopia, the cinemas close during the summer, but if, after a consensus of opinion has been taken, an agreed minimum of people want them open, they must stay open for an agreed number of hours per week. Because it is a basic principle of Utopia that people must have what they want, so long as it is not antisocial. The Utopians, not prepared to have laws dictated to them, are certainly not going to have their pleasures dictated to them. Nor is it any part of the utopian scheme that everyone shall like the same things. They know that human nature is complex and varied, highly individual, that there is no question of imposing ideas from above, whether in the matter of education, art, or the enjoyment of leisure. But leisure in utopia is a subject in itself, and a highly important one.